There are no easy or hard implant cases. Let me explain. Oftentimes, when, as an industry, when we have a discussion regarding dental implants, you'll hear people say, I'll use guided when I have a tough case. When I have a, an easy case, I'm just going to freehand it. But let me explain to you what we're really saying when we say that. So if we look to the answer, aesthetic zone, we oftentimes don't have very much room for play. We have very limited volume of bone and we have vital structures on the left and right of our implant. We have teeth right around it, right? And it's in the aesthetic zone. It has to look good. So in cases like that, a lot of times people say, well, I'll use a guide for the sole purpose of ensuring that my implant goes in the right location within a couple hundred microns of its desired position, prosthodontically driven. That same person might say to someone, but when I'm in the posterior, I don't often use a guide. And so what they're indicting themselves by saying this is that in the posterior, if I'm off by one or two millimeters in a positional direction, I don't care. And that is a, that's, that's a failure to understand the significance of that error. That posterior tooth deserves the same amount of attention and festivity, the same amount of attention and festooning that we would apply to the front tooth. It deserves the same solution. It deserves an implant placed within a few hundred microns of the desired prosthodontic outcome. When you place an implant and it's off by one or two millimeters, you immediately create a Snoopy. You create enormous amounts of biomechanical complications for that solution for life. There's no way around it. That patient is now given a solution that will be less than optimal as long as that implant remains in the mouth, okay? Until the time that you just take the crown off because the screw keeps loosening so many times and the, and the, and the ceramic keeps debonding from the abutment so many times that you just take it off and bury it. And then everything's fine because you're not using it anymore, right? The back teeth and the front teeth deserve equal attention. The implant must be placed prosthodontically driven, not anatomically driven. And for those people that say that, the failure is in the educational system. The failure is in our community as a whole to accept that colloquial term and say, I agree with that. When there's ample volumes of bone, I don't care if I'm off. Well, that's an anatomical approach, right? That's where we were decades ago when we didn't have digital technology, when we didn't have the ability to easily prosthodontically back into an ideal optimized implant size and location. But we can do that now in about 60 seconds. So if I can do that now with a prosthodontically driven protocol, I don't ever want to go back to the old anatomical approach. The anatomical approach was flap, flap the ridge, look at the bone, place the implant in the bone. Once it integrates, everything's fine, right? We're gonna just pass the buck down to the whoever's doing the restorative. Now the restorative can be quite complicated because you might immediately have to go uh, with a complicated custom abutment in order to manage the fact that the screw axis holes not in the right location. And now you've got a cantilever. Now you've got a complicated uh, chair side cementation that you have to manage. It takes a lot more chair time. So it's, it's no benefit to the team. It's no benefit to the dental office. It's more, it's more expenses to your office and it increases the risk for the patient. There's no win there. There's zero win with an anatomical approach. There's no win for the dentist and there's no win for the patient. When you go prosthodontically driven and you use a tool to help ensure that your implant goes where you planned it so that you execute properly, now you have a solution that is going to reduce your overhead in your practice, you're going to be more efficient, you're gonna have a better experience for the patient and the patient's gonna have a solution that's likely gonna last the rest of their life. And that's a, a great win for everyone. So the dichotomy between these two approaches is enormous. It's not anywhere close to being the same. This is not a scale where they're just a little off. This is a scale where the, the two sides are very, very dramatically different in terms of magnitude. So I would encourage you to consider these thoughts and entertain them in your, in your future educational opportunities and look for a course where they are prosthodontically 
doing the cases so that you can have these wonderfully expedient cases for your patient, which are profitable for you and rewarding for everyone. I'm not sure it's a generational thing. I think it's just evolution. I think uh, despite how many old timers want to cling to the old ways, once you see the efficiencies, once you see how easy it is to execute the said plan and have a just a, a marvelous solution uh, that is independent of clinical hand skill. So basically, any, I could give one of my surgical cases to any clinician on the planet, any clinician, and they could drill through that guide and place that implant in the exact same location that I do every single time. So you eliminate the art and the dexterity that's so often associated with dental implants or, or, or with any dentistry that we do. There's an art and, and hand skills, having hands or dexterity that's associated with it. When it comes to placing a dental implant, if it was planned properly and you have a surgical guide in order to execute that plan, then just about anyone could slide in, just about anyone could slide right into the to the right hand side of the patient and drill the hole and place the implant and have darn near exact outcomes across the planet. It eliminates that requirement of having hands, of having art, of having uh, a visualization, a three dimensional visualization of a, of a of a human skull while you're working on it. It's not easy to do. Very few people have that. Can it be done? Yes. Has it been done in the past? Yes. But the number of people that have that ability is extremely low. The vast proponents of people would rather just use an instrument. So when you get to the point in your career where you use an instrument, where you're trained appropriately, okay? Because what happens a lot of times is people will go to a guided course, which isn't really a guided course. It was a course that was designed to get you there by putting on the, on the, 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 it was a course designed to get you to the course by putting on the list of, of, offerings that they do guided, okay? And so you go, oh, I want to learn about guided, but really it's someone who's not doing guided who says, and while we're here, while we're doing freehand, you can learn, this is what we do with guided. And you don't learn how to do guided. So you think you learned about guided, but it's not in a guided course. And so then when you try it, you have a, you have a complication and they go, and that's why most of the class was dedicated to freehand because all these complications can happen with guided, so you, you should know how to do freehand which I totally disagree with. If you go to a course that's properly constructed and you learn how to do guided, you will never have to go to freehand, ever. There's never, I haven't done a freehand implant since the fully guided cases came out darn near a decade ago. Never, not a single one. I've never had an implant. I've never had a case where I've had to take out a broken guide and revert to anatomical approaches to try to place an implant, ever in my entire career, and that includes individual implants, as well as all of my full mouth cases. It just doesn't happen. So when people say, well, you gotta know how to do, you gotta know how to do the old way, because what if the tool breaks, the guide, the tool breaks? And I go, well, if you, if you believe that statement, you are listening to someone who has fed you a colloquialism. It's a red herring. They've told you that this is something you need to do. And you believe it. Salespeople are great at this. Now you wonder why would a salesperson at a trade show, you know, you're at Chicago Midwinter or you're at the Greater New York meeting and the salesperson says, well, we've, we've got our guided kit here, but we have our freehand kit here too. And I really encourage you to buy the guided and the freehand because you never know when the guided might not work. Why would a salesperson encourage you to buy two surgical kits? I'm not even going to answer that question. Okay, so we're going to regurgitate things in the industry. We're going to continue to regurgitate folklore, dental folklore, in order to meet business objectives for corporations. Or are we going to look at them objectively and say, maybe this guy's onto something. Maybe if if it's done properly and I'm properly educated on how to use this tool, like any other tool that you learn, any other tool in dentistry that you learn to use, if you're properly educated, they work really well. So if you become properly educated, you can go out there and crush cases immediately that you never thought you could take on. Now, the back side to this story is that, remember, the, the, the guide is the tool to execute your plan. If you don't have a plan, then you got a guide to nowhere. It's like a bridge to nowhere, right? Remember that? 
the bridge to nowhere, right? You got to have a plan. So then people say, well, what do you mean? Well, if I was to say to you that I have in my course, I have 21 different guidelines that we do as a check step for every single implant we place. And then I was to turn to someone who's a freehand dentist. And I said, before you place that implant today, this afternoon, when you're going to place that implant, can you just write down on a piece of paper your guidelines for success? I don't know that they could get past three. Get implant in bone, right? That, that, that's the freehand approach. Get implant in bone. Try not to hit vital structures. Try. Capital. Try not to hit vital structures, right? There's very little in terms of a freehand implant placement where they can articulate the optimal implant location. When you do a virtual surgery, you have 100% control over where the implant's going on the computer screen, right? It's rather scary to someone who hasn't had that power and control who's been placing implants for a while to realize they have 100% control over where to place the implant and they don't know where to place it because they never thought about it that way. What they've done is they've looked at the bone and they go, there's the thicker part of the bone, there's the volume of bone, I know I'm gonna get primary stability, and I put the implant there. Well, primary stability is important, but primary stability with an implant in the wrong location doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve anyone. You gotta get the implant in the right location. Well, where's the right location? Well, let's go to the computer screen before we start. Let's do a virtual surgery to size the implant so we get the exact size that we need, length and diameter before we start, in the right location, and then use the tool to execute. So just so that you understand, when you're looking for an educational opportunity, you must be trained on the planning part, how do I plan appropriately, and then the execution part, and now how do I execute appropriately. Guys, this has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, The Smile Engineer. If you've liked this content, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you have any comments, we'd love to get them in the bottom below.